afternoon and welcome to the Full Scottish on Sunday the 21st of November. My name is Maggie Lennon. I'll start the programme as usual with the most up-to-date coronavirus statistics. As of two o'clock yesterday, 2,756 newly confirmed cases of COVID were reported in Scotland. There were 11 newly reported deaths of people who tested positive and 4,337,089 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination. 3,936,594 have received their second and 1,375,779 have received a third dose or booster. 767 people were in hospital with recently confirmed COVID-19, 61 of whom were in intensive care. Since the start of the pandemic, a total of 701,719 people in Scotland have tested positive for COVID-19 and sadly, we've recorded 9,478 deaths. I'm joined today by Kurt Bessiner, Senior Associate of the Democratisation Policy Council, and Colette Stevenson, MSP for the SNP for East Kilbride. Good afternoon to you both. Thank you for having me. Good, well, good afternoon. <clears throat> it's 26 years or so since the end of the Bosnian War and the creation of the Dayton Accord, which was meant to bring lasting peace to the area. Things have been kicking off quite badly in Bosnia, and that peace now looks more fragile than ever. Kurt, you're a bit of an expert on Bosnia. For our viewers, can you just simply, if you can, sum up what the Dayton mm -hmm. Accord was about, what it was trying to achieve, and whether, in your opinion, you think actually it was ever likely to bring lasting peace to that area, and what's going wrong at the moment? Well, I mean, the Dayton Peace Accords were brokered by, by the United States uh, at uh, Air Force Base in, in Dayton, Ohio, uh, by the very forceful American diplomat, uh, Richard Holbrook. Uh, and what the Accords were aiming to do was to bring that three and a half year war to an end. It killed 100,000 people. Uh, it was the third war in a series of, of wars in the collapse of Yugoslavia and by far the bloodiest. Um, and what it did was it finally brought in uh, Western diplomatic firepower, but backed by actual military firepower to, to, to compel the combatants to, to stop fighting. This was a war with genocide, uh, legally, legally adjudicated genocide that's, that, that happened not just at Srebrenica, but elsewhere in the country. Um, and what it did was it came up with a power sharing agreement among the former combatants. Uh, Repre uh, represented by by three constituent peoples uh, Bosniaks, Muslims, Croats, and Serbs, and they divided the country into two entities that were sub-state but had a lot of a lot of attributes of statehood. Um, it was probably given everything that had happened up to that point, as far as you could go in terms of getting getting uh, a ceasefire agreement, and uh, the constitution of Bosnia Herzegovina is included in the agreement. And it's for. But most of the people who were brokers uh, recognized that this was something that was a, a stopgap, uh, that it was not going to be something that had, was integrative in terms of, of its incentive structure. Um, for the first decade after the war, there was a lot of international engagement and pressure. Uh, I worked for one of the international high representatives who was in charge of overseeing the implementation of that peace agreement, Patty Ashdown. Uh, and at the end of uh, 2005, the presumption was European Union enlargement uh, and NATO enlargement was going to impel the political elites of that country to, to continue moving forward uh, in building the state, building integrative institutions, and ultimately meeting, meeting democratic human rights uh, transparency standards to join these clubs. What we've seen over the intervening 16 years is that those incentives aren't there. They want to keep what they stole, remain positioned to keep stealing, and remain unaccountable. So uh, what we see now is what, what Dayton really is, is free range Dayton without any international, uh, sufficient international engagement to compel the political elites to, to, to try to build a functioning state. Instead, they're trying to optimize it to be even more feudal than the deal that they agreed at Dayton. Uh, and where you, where, what you have now on the ground is, uh, in particular, 
the Bosnian Serb political leader, Milorad Dodik, threatening the move toward, toward independence. He claims it's not independence, but pulling out state institutions and forming an army, the same army uh, or the, an army that of uh, Bosnian, Bosnian Serbs that committed the genocide. He's a, geni- uh, so and he's, a, he's a genocide denier as well, is he not? That's correct. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and not yeah. just a casual one, but one who's, who's, who's gone out of his way to, to deny that these things happened and, and try to recontextualize uh, but, the but, events but the of the war. But the other team that have joined the party is Russia. They've started to make mm-hmm. a huge fuss about the fact that Christian Schmidt, who is the high rep to Bosnia, is basically mm-hmm. cut out of the picture. He's wanting all references to them removed. Um, and my understanding is the um, agreement that keeps the NATO forces and the EU army in place in Bosnia is coming up for renewal within the next few days, and that Russia have said they'll veto that unless something is done about dealing with this reference to the, to the, the high representative. And so... Uh- what what happens if the if the all the I mean I know the forces that are there are not very big I mean we're talking hundreds not thousands but is that mm-hmm. a real possibility that they will be pulled out and then what happens? Well, the, 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 that vote happened earlier this month, and okay. what 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 the what ended up happening was that the, to appease the Russians and get the the renewal of the U four mandate. This is an EU military force. Uh, that's been on the ground since 2004, which took over from NATO, which initially did enforce the peace, and is still backed by NATO under what they call Berlin Plus arrangement. So, NATO NATO is sort of the reinsurer of of the EU's deterrent force. Uh, all the references, or or most of the references to the international high representative that had been sort of industry standard boilerplate in these UN Security Council resolutions were stripped out. So legally, that didn't affect uh, Christian Schmidt's uh, mandate. But politically, it sent a message of weakening resolve. Uh, so what we have now is 660 EU troops that cannot defend the airport, let alone, uh, or and their 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 deployed troops in small small pockets throughout the country. If there was a challenge, uh, an unwillingness of any of the the NATO powers to reinforce the force to deterrent strength, um, and so you have a real security threat. If there is an, a pullout of of Bosnian Serbs from institutions, including the military, and uh, an attempt to sort of enforce a border on what's not a border, it's called the interending boundary line, then there's there's a high likelihood of that that somebody will get hurt, and and so, and did, a real yes. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. So two things then. What what you seem to be saying is that Dodik's aggression is being almost rewarded by the UN. That they've yes. kind of capitulated. He's a bully, and he's got his bullies over in Russia backing him up, and they've gone, "We'll back off." But if that's not enough, uh, do you do you actually think there is a real possibility of conflict in that region again? Yes. Yes. Not a la 1992. The correlation of forces is not the same. You don't have the same heavy weapons, but everybody's about armed equally with small arms. Uh, and and the the potential for miscalculation is extremely high. The, the Unlike 1992, uh, you have uh, mandates that allow uh, the EU and NATO to prevent conflict, but we have not been willing to do that. Instead, we're trying, we're spending most of our political energy on attempting to reformulate the electoral and constitutional structure to appease Dodik, his mm-hmm. Bosnian Croat ally Dragan Čović, um, to 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 tighten up their fiefdoms, and this would benefit the the, the Bosniak uh, ethnic leader as well, ultimately. So what we're we're actually trying to do before the elections about a year from now is uh, give them an incumbent protection program uh, in lieu of dealing with the security threat. Which is, I think that's an incredibly dangerous policy, but that's the policy that effectively we collectively have right now. This is maybe a simple question, and it's maybe the wrong question, but would it be that bad if the two parts of the country did separate into two competing states? Wouldn't that keep people safe? Uh, No. (laughs) First of all, because tearing along the dotted line, ethnic cleansing didn't completely succeed, and that's Mm. a horrible term anyway. Uh, people have returned to homes, not everybody by any means, 
uh, <clears throat> but it not it is not an easy 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 tear along line to disaggregate the country. And there are a lot of people who would not take kindly to being being made unsafe where they live, I suppose or it, having the country split. I, I suppose it conjures yeah. up the idea of, of partition in India and Pakistan. Yeah, it would be and those, and, and those images, be. those images of hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people having to be physically moved from one part of the country to the other. Clearly, this has been driven by a toxic brand of nationalism on behalf of the Bosnian Serb leader and his chums. Um, and, and what we can often see when things like this happen in different parts of the world, when separatist, separatist movements are seen to be a threat, is that it, people who don't believe in separatism, certainly people in this country who don't believe in um, the breakup of the United Kingdom, try to tar nationalist separatists with the same brush. Are you in the least bit concerned that, um, that this toxic nationalism is kind of used to throw a bad light on what people in Scotland who are wanting Scotland to become independent? Um, whilst I understand, um, Maggie, that, you know, the issues over in Bosnia are, are really contentious and, and there's a lot of unfinished business there. Um, from an <clears throat> extreme nationalist point of view, over here in Scotland, um, we have a, I, I believe we have a very healthy debate and, you know, despite the, the referendum, which um, didn't go our way in 2014, I, I still continue to see it. I mean, there has been small, um, you know, um, pockets of people wanting UDI uh, plebiscites and whatnot. However, I still see, you know, that argument for an independent Scotland to be a healthy one. And, um, you know, leading that um, as a yes movement here in Scotland and also obviously SNP um, are very pro-independence and we, we really, you know, at the end of the day, it's the democratic will of the people. Um, you see again um, Northern Ireland, a classic example of, of partition there. Um, however, I, I truly believe we don't have that level of extreme nationalism and, I, you know, I, I went and done a bit of research in terms of Bosnia and see that that you know that divide there, um, and it still exists in terms of you know um, how the delineation um, comes into play as well. And and I sincerely hope that the actual you know factions that are occurring actually you know look to other Western uh, areas, particularly here in Scotland. Um, to resolve the matter and, and keep on, you know, rebuilding their lives because that's e effectively what they're trying to do. Um, especially the women, uh, you've got to praise the women over there for the work that they have done, given the, you know, the, ad er, you know, the adversarial um, impact it had on them. Yeah, we've had actually um, representatives from Bosnian women's organisations on the programme before. It just goes to show how long this particular story has been rumbling, as it, that, that something is going wrong and things could get really bad. Um, Kurt, just to come back to you finally on this story, do you mm -hmm. think this potential, we've said this potential for conflict, do you think this potential for making, a, a sort of destabilising the wider area, um, not to the same extent as 1992, but do you think there's... There's something else that might happen in the area that we should be aware of or, or concerned about. Yes, yes, but I want to give you a quick upside too. I mean, the, 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 if, if I believed that the leaders like Milorad Dodik were avatars of, of, of their people the way they claim to be, I would, I would worry, I would despair about any positive future for Bosnia Herzegovina. I don't believe that's the case. And what's perverse about this is that they are doing this at a time of weakness for themselves. They're very, very unpopular because of the way they responded to COVID as well as the way they've governed. So, but the, the potential for destabilization is very high. Bosnia is the, the center of the conflict system. In the Balkans. It's the big prize for Serbian nationalists. It's the easiest place for Russia to, to, to put the West on the back foot uh, and humiliate us uh, in a place where we have had a dominant position since the end of the war and still have a mo the most powerful set of tools that we have, more powerful than anywhere else on earth. Uh, and we're the fact that we've allowed things to descend on this trajectory for 15 years, predictably uh, ending where we are, is, is, a, is a reflection of an enormous policy failure. 
but it wouldn't end with Bosnia. Um, uh, Montenegro has been on the menu. Serbian nationalists are, are definitely trying to be dominant there. Uh, the, the, there have been arguments for, for ethnic partition of the entire former Yugoslav area, which would inherently be bloody. Anybody who talks about partition, this is not peaceful. This is, always involves violence. Mm. And it's delusional to think that, you, that this, this would be resolved peacefully given what's already happened, uh, the traumas that, that attended the last time people tried to do this, uh, and the different geopolitical situation that we're in now via V, uh, via V, the mid nineties, where we, you know, the, the West was dominant and that we're no longer dominant globally anymore. And you don't have to be a historian to know that when the Balkans go wrong, it goes wrong very badly. I mean, that was really where the first world war began and in recent history. So I think it's, it's, rather odd that the sort of the European Union and certainly the United States are not really prepared to take a stronger position on this. If you, as you say, the whole area has potential to implode again um, and the, the impacts that will have. I was in, interesting that you used the word that it would be a good way for Russia to humiliate Europe. And um, that seems to be very much Vladimir Putin's um, modus operandi at the moment. And he's trying that in lots of different places. Not least, I think, by backing up and supporting um, Belarus in what it's been doing recently. Belarus, of course, is more recently in the news because of the migrant crisis. Lushenko has allowed, in fact, enticed, I think would be not too much of a word, um, thousands upon thousands of migrants into Belarus with the promise that they'll be able to cross easily into Poland and then on, hence on to the EU. The BBC, in what can only be described as a rather odd editorial policy, chose to give or d broadcast um, a unique interview with Lukashenko in which he is very clear about that. He admits he may have helped people cross over to the EU and he actually is on air saying, I'm not going to stop migrants coming because they don't want to be in my country, they want to be in yours. He's not even going to investigate the stories of people allowing uh, people to get through the border. Um, Colette, um, I don't know if you've been watching the Belarusian position clear, clearly. I don't know if you've been watching the stories. But what do you make of the position in Belarus with these poor migrants sitting on the border? They've now been put in a warehouse because it's very cold. Um, uh, and there's no suggestion that there's any other future plan for them if they get sent back, if they get to stay, whether there'll be any kind of humanitarian corridor. When you see these stories, what's your initial reaction? <clears throat> it's um, absolutely horrifying, um, Maggie, and at the heart of this, um, every single person here, you know, um, as an individual, <clears throat> has got a story to tell. And I mean, I, I know that, uh, you know, whilst they're trying to get a, through in a corridor, <clears throat> there's somebody like Lefichenko who, are, you know, using these people as a ransom against the EU because of the sanctions that they've placed on them. And I mean, it's it's unbelievable to think that you know and, and i think it's been said time and time again even within the press as well recently is why somebody like that is actually still in power um and i know that um the us have been making inroads to see what they can try and do there i, I feel that the eu need to come in a bit stronger on that as well um and you know th these migrants you know that are coming through the asylum seekers um, as I said, every single one of them has got a story to tell, the horrific journey that they've gone through, and then they're just getting used as leverage over something something that, um, you know, Lefichenko is trying to do, um, you know, in order, you know, to, to put, to, you know, some kind of leverage or ransom the EU, um, you know, and obviously there's Putin actually pulling the strings here as well. Well, certainly that was the, the suggestion over the threat that Belarus, Belarus would turn off the gas supply to Europe because one of the main um, pipelines runs through Belarus. We're going to turn off the gas if you don't um, either take the migrants or stop the sanctions that you've put up against us. Um, Kurt, I was quite intrigued when I watched the interview with Lukashenko um, it's not often that you hear a dictator, maybe it is, but I don't think it's that often you hear a dictator being quite quite as blunt about his policy. He admitted to beatings in detention centres quite openly. 
And perhaps more chillingly, he talked about the 270 non-governmental organisations that are funded by the EU, which in the last few years he has closed down. And he actually referred to them as scum to be massacred. Now, let's just ask the question, why is a man like that still in power? Why on earth is the EU allowing a man like this on their borders to come out with nonsense like this? Or what can they do, if anything? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, Lukashenko has been a shameless dictator for a very long time. Uh, I, I, uh, 20 years ago, I was, I was an election observer in Belarus just before 9-11. Uh, and, and it was quite shameless then, and it's only become more so since. Um, the European Union, I mean, there, there, there's, there's a story here. The European Union has a problem of illiberals in its own ranks, <laughs> including Poland. Uh, and, and the, the only, the European Union has been talking about its ability to, you know, uh, an idea of strategic, uh, strategic autonomy that the, the, the Emmanuel Macron has put forward, um, but has never really wanted to deal with defense issues, but on, on, on defending, and I'm putting that in air quotes against migrants, they're very hard line and they, they have, they have, they have, they have quite um heavy defense defense mechanism again in quotation marks against unarmed people it's just against armed opponents that they they have have not had the will to develop their the capabilities in the european union uh lukashenko recognized the vulnerability that job number one of the eu is to keep people out and he saw this and he and so the the polls played into what he and backed by russia has done uh, in a relatively small number of people, uh, the Poles refused to get Frontex there on the frontier because they wanted to play this up as, a, as a, for domestic political purposes uh, and portray this as sort of defending Western civilization against Eastern hordes. That was a term that the Pol Polish governments used. So um, there's no doubt that these people have been exploited and, and enticed was not, I mean, encouraged to come to, 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 to be funneled to the European border with full knowledge that, that one way or another, uh, this would, this would look bad for Poland and the EU either, either they would be, they would be processed in which case there would be a, there would be a, a, a pull factor, um, or they would be, they would be treated horribly. Uh, in which case the EU looks terrible. Uh, and so in a way, Lukashenko can't lose in this. Um, uh, uh, it, does, it does seem like there was, there was some pull to, to de-escalate, but we'll see if that actually happens. Uh, but in any case, it, it exposes that European Union does not have unity uh, on, on actually a migrant policy other than Fortress Europe. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And in fact, the European Union doesn't have unity in a heck of a lot of things. But it seems to be increasingly that the EU has no effective answer to anyone who wants to show a sense of entitlement or a sense of aggression. It's just, you just we'll just let you go on with it. Now, there's been a suggestion that Angela Merkel and Lushenko have had lots of telephone conversations and that she was prepared to go to the EU in, you know, in her final days um, to negotiate a humanitarian corridor. But the Germans have absolutely denied that and said that didn't happen at all. Um, and because of the, the pretty serious domestic fallout in Germany after uh, Germany was opened the doors so graciously and so widely at the last migrant crisis, I think it's a bit unlikely, um, Colette, do you think it's a bit unlikely that Germany might take that role again? Uh, given the, um, the departure of Angela Merkel uh, and who's coming in, uh, you know, um, to govern over Germany, um, I sincerely hope so. I hope they use um, what they've done so far in terms of helping these migrants, um, you know, and at least set an example, given, you know, the the relative, you know, uncertainty within the EU is what we've just spoken about. Um, uh, so and what Kurt's mentioned as well. So, uh, you know, again, even within Scotland, we've very much welcomed and, you know, migrants as well. Um, and I, I really hope that, you know, more of that happens and that we're not, you know, using it from a domestic point of view, such as you mentioned, Kurt, in, in Poland as well. 
um, you know, to use them as leverage. I mean, the heart of this is is, is people in, in their lives, people that are actually fleeing conflict, um, you know, children, women, you know, men, and, and we should be offering them sanctuary. Well, of course, the sad thing is the mistreatment of asylum seekers and refugees and the mistreatment of people who support them is not reserved to countries on the outskirts of the EU. It's happening within the EU itself and it's happening within Greece. There has been a long running nine month um, uh, court case against 25 aid workers, including an Irish national, who have been accused of espionage, forgery, intercepting radio frequencies who are facing up to eight years in prison for the simple crime, in air quotes, of um, assisting search and rescue work on the Isle of Lesbos, which has um, uh, uh, several very large refugee camps. Um, the trial, which was meant to be finished this week, has been postponed, keeping those poor people in limbo because the judges that were hearing it didn't feel felt they had all the competence to hear it. But this attack on people who are being who are showing migrant solidarity is a real worry. Someone has described it as a criminalisation of humanitarianism. Would you say that was a, a reasonable thing to call it, Kurt? Yes. Yes. No, I think I think unfortunately that's exactly true. And that's the sort of segue from the last story you have. And also looking at the Balkans, just to I mean that this is a region that's depopulated because of malgovernance and they're all going to the EU and the EU is happy to take them in because they assimilate easily. We, we, they learned that in the 1990s. But um, something that I had, I had thought, but only rethought recently is, you know, the EU doesn't get deterrence because of the story we were talking about in Bosnia where they have an actual deterrent mandate, but they absolutely get deterrence when it comes, comes to, to the question of migration and asylum seekers. And it's not just deterrence of the, the, the migrants by, by, hostile environment policies or hostile policies on the border, it's uh, it's deterrence of their own citizens helping them. And yeah. that's what this case in Greece demonstrates, is 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 this is simply for, for terror effect, of to make make clear, and, and Greece is not the only country that's doing this sort of thing. I mean, this is, you see this, you see this around the periphery. Well, you're, is, well this, actually, you're right. Um, apparently, I was astonished when I discovered this, there are 180 people involved in NGO work that are in support of migrants in 13 European countries who are also facing criminalisation. That's an astonishing. It is. Now, yeah. now we've got, we, we, we haven't quite got that position in the UK, Colette. No one, as far as I know, working in an NGO supporting refugees and migrants is facing a criminal charge. But we're not far off it when you consider the sorts of things that Priti Patel has been saying, specifically, for example, about the RNLI, that if they go to save people in peril in the sea, which is what they're meant to do, that they will actually be facing criminal charges. So it's moving in to the narrative in the UK. And in fact, she's come out very strongly in recent weeks using this phrase, we will have a firm but fair asylum system, which is exactly the phrase that the Greek authorities have been using. And I understand she's looking very closely at the specifics of the way that Greece processes asylum seekers. So um, what's, uh, what's your message to Priti Patel? Um, uh, again, I mean, I watched this morning on um, Andrew Marr and it was Sajid Javid that was on the UK Health Minister. Um, and he was asked about the issue to do with uh, the migrants and asylum seekers trying to get over as well, um, and, and, and the constant pushback there. And I couldn't actually believe what he said. He said, if they were true asylum seekers, <laughs> um, you know, fleeing conflict within their country, then why did they not just stop off at their first port of call, which would have maybe have been France forever? For, for, um, again, that narrative, you know, really struck home in terms of, you know, we should be welcoming these people with open arms and, and, and you know, again, providing them with sanctuary. It, we're, you know, probably muscling in and gra grasping the like as well. Um, and again, I, I actually, you know, can't believe that we're um, and, and not 
allowing them, you know, to get help as well. And so when um, Priti Patel as well has been forced to say that she's not been hard enough, you know, in terms of her immigration um, bill, and and I know that there's one coming forward, I think, within the next few weeks as well, Maggie. So um, it will be interesting to see what course of action she actually takes. Um, but I, I actually find that horrifying because for the, one of the reasons that they do come over here is the fact that they, they obviously have family over here and a lot of them speak English. So, you know, it, it's not so much a hostile environment for them, whereas if they were, were maybe heading to, to Greece. But some, some of the things that I'm hearing about at the borders and, and the implications that she's put on the RNLI are, are, are really, really disturbing. So Pudji Patel regularly claims that 70% of people who are crossing, especially in small boats, are not um, have no real grounds to come. They're not asylum seekers. But actually, research shows that of those who've crossed in the last four or five years, 66% have been granted leave to remain. So it's exactly the opposite of what she said. She says 70% are not justified. In actual fact, nearly 70% are given leave to remain. So the figures by her own department tell the lie that she's giving. She's under the cost just now because 23,000 people have crossed already in 2021, 5,000 alone in November. November has never seen numbers like that. Normally, the small boats cross in the warmer weather, which obviously makes sense. There were just over 8,000 in 2020, but that was because of the pandemic. No one was moving around the world then. It's way lower than the 84, 85,000 that were coming seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. But she, she was basically given the job as Home Secretary on the promise that she would put an end to stopping this. Um, and really, it's very difficult to see how she's going to be able to do it unless she is prepared and unless Britain is prepared to break international law after international law, which, of course, they've already kind of hinted. Um, Colette, it was interesting you mentioned the reasons that people come. So the Home Office commissioned quite recently um, a report on just what was the pool factors to people to the UK. That report has not been published. No one's able to see it, so we can only guess what's in it. But we have to assume that what's in it isn't what the Home Office expected to see in it. 16 years ago, the Home Office commissioned a similar report from Cardiff University. And they tried to bury that as well. Because what it proved was people weren't coming for the benefit system. They weren't coming because they saw Britain as a soft target. They were coming for the reasons you mentioned. English is an international language, which they may have spoken some of. They were established communities, if not families. Um, they were established families, uh, established communities, if not families in the UK. And perhaps maybe the most ironic of all is that they absolutely believed through medium like the BBC World Service that Britain was a country that stood up against bullies and dictators and therefore they were very likely to get a fair <coughs> hearing and sanctuary if they came to the UK. Now, Home Office didn't want to hear that 16 years ago. I'm assuming the evidence is similar, which, which is why it's buried. Um, obviously in Scotland, Colette, we're lucky, although we don't control immigration, we do control the drivers of integration through the reserved, uh, uh, through the devolved um, uh, areas that we have responsibility for. Is there any more you would like to see the Scottish Government do for asylum seekers who are lucky enough to be dispersed to Scotland? I mean, I think, you know, the stories that I'm hearing from the people that, that have came to Scotland, Maggie, and from a local authority perspective, we're, we're doing some fantastic work. Um, I'm, I'm going to be meeting with a group from East Renfrewshire and, and people that have actually settled here as well in East Kilbride. Now, the, I mean, again and again, I often see in, in Brexit, it's been a huge issue. Um, you know, there's been a brain drain in terms of our skills. Is the problem we've got is migration and not immigration. So for you know, pretty to propel, um, and and you know the the strict sanctions that she's putting on people, you know, accessing um, you know, the UK in particular Scotland, you know, ha, ha, has we've seen it time and time again the impact that it's had on you know our, our markets as well, particularly in our care you know, our care sector as well. So um, I would like, you know, I think the Scottish Government done, have, have done a really remarkable job um, in terms of settling these people. 
uh, and making them, you know, as welcome as possible. Um, I know there's been challenges in terms of housing them, but, you know, given that we have got, you know, um, you know, devolved, you know, powers, there's only so much that we can actually do. Um, and I truly believe in an independent Scotland, we would, you know, welcome them with open arms. Okay, so moving on then from um, the fact that Europe seems to be in a bit of a mess at the moment, um, we'll go over to the United States now, because actually things there have, have, have gotten a bit, a bit nasty in the last few hours. Um, the young man Rittenhouse, an 18-year-old who went to a Black Lives Matter uh, event last year, uh, I think in Wisconsin, as a vigilante mm -hmm. to support the police, um, shot three men, three white men, and he was. His trial has just finished, and against everyone's expectations, he has been found not guilty on all five counts after the jury taking four days to deliberate. So, um, Kurt, this seems to me that what this is saying is Black Lives Matter, but it seems that white lives and guns matter more in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unfortunately you could hear a lot of un, uh, African American fellow citizens of mine saying we 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 actually did expect this kid to get off. Uh, the um, there was a lot of of discussion during the trial about the disposition of the judge, uh, who disallowed the 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 men who get got shot from being called victims, but they were allowed to be called rioters and so forth. And this young man, you know, he's 17 when he committed, committed, well, he didn't commit the crime legally now that he's been adjudicated. But when he shot these people, he crossed a state line, came over from Illinois. So he wasn't a resident of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is on the Illinois-Wisconsin border um, along the shores of Lake Michigan. He crossed a state line with a, with a firearm that, that, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a quasi-military weapon. Uh, saying he wanted to deliver first aid, but he, you know, a reasonable person could could presume that he was looking for trouble, uh, and he found it. Um, so it's it's a it's a very disturbing signal in an already febrile, very divided the United States. Um, I, I I hate to say that I've seen a lot of the uh, the sort of top down efforts to divide people. That I that I learned about in the Balkans firsthand uh, applied in my own country now, and it's it's terrifying. But it's it, I, I actually think it's it's got more purchase at the popular level in the United States that that divisiveness than it actually does at the popular level in the Balkans, which might sound counterintuitive to your viewers, but I think that's actually the case. Well, I think that also the disturbing thing is how much the the right wing have celebrated this acquittal yeah. um donald trump was tweeting his congratulations perhaps that's no surprise fox news i think are planning a major interview with them next week and they're also planning a documentary film some right-wing senators offered him an internship and the man himself the young man himself has been tweeting and this is chilling be armed be dangerous be moral colette right there that's a reason for re-arresting him, surely. Isn't that an insightful incitement to hatred? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I can't believe that he's actually, you know, got away with that. And whilst I know Biden, um, you know, was, you know, expressed his concern, but huge concerns um, regarding this, um, it is giving a voice to white supremacy and extremism over, you know, in America and the fact that Trump's come out. Uh, and, you know, actually acknowledged that and accepted that justice has been served. Um, it says it all, really. Um, and, but what's more concerning is that people that are wanting to carry out a peaceful rally, as we do here, there's, all, you know, more often than not that we have a lot of really good, positive, you know, peaceful rallies over here in terms of independence um, that, you know, that, on the back of that, this is happening. And, you know, I think, you know, reading from the story, Maggie, he, he sought out trouble and he's now got away with it. Um, even looking at the court case as well, uh, he tried to defend himself. Um, and, and even, you know, 
saying that what somebody was armed but two other people weren't so he's effectively got away when you know murdering two people that were not were unarmed so i mean without getting into all the details of it the fact that he's inciting more trouble on the back of, of what's happened um you know uh, it, it is really really concerning especially given you know the first amendment over in america and you know the right to you know peaceful rally and to have that voice um you know, as a democratic process as well. So, yeah. Ah, but, it, but, it, but it appears the right to bear arms trumps everything, even though the right to bear arms was introduced in the Constitution in a context which isn't relevant at all these days. It's like black lives didn't matter, never happened, is it, Kurt? It's like George yeah, Floyd, I mean, this I... never happened. We're back to just white supremacy being allowed to carry on. Well, what, what, what the dynamic that you saw is really, really quite shocking that, that you, you got to a point after the George Floyd murder, uh, and that has been adjudicated as such, uh, that um, you had a lot of, of, of white support for Black Lives Matter until it got turned into a, a, a fear mongering campaign from the top. From Donald Trump and the right wing media and his and his party, which he's completely absorbed. It's become a Trump cult party, the Republicans, and 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 made that into a divisive issue. Uh, when the vast majority of 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 the Black Lives Matter uh, rallies and protests were nonviolent. There were there were some violent rallies, but you, you'll find that most of the people that were doing the violence, for example, in Portland and other places, were white people. Uh, so it's a very uh, on, it is as if this nothing happened, but it's worse than that because I would say it has be, become more polarized because because the right wing has managed to get a large segment of the white population to be afraid. Uh, and that is a very effective tool. People who are afraid can do terrible things, as we've seen in many places, including the Balkans. And uh, that is what some, that's effectively the, the, the divider, uh, the wedge issue that, that's being used. And it, we'll see that in the 22, 2022 uh, midterm elections. Well, that's how right-wing politics operates, though, is we tell you what you're frightened of, even if it's actually not the thing you're frightened of. Yeah. We tell you what you're frightened of because it's a thing that we think we can fix or we have the solution for or it's simplistic and there's the solution. And as I say, with them, you know, the likes of Fox News get, making this, turning this man into a celebrity effectively, you can see where that's going. However, obviously, it's not just the states where racism in, is endemic. And in Britain, just in the last couple of weeks, the whole horror of racism in sport has come back up to the surface. It started with the claims about racism in cricket in Yorkshire, in the Yorkshire County Cricket Club. Um, just today, we've been hearing about racism in football, in particular um, around referees, that the fact that black and Asian referees are facing constant abuse and prejudice and lack of progression into the higher levels of the game. Um, Colette, maybe we should ask uh, the leader of the Conservative Party in Scotland about that. He's a referee, isn't he? Yeah, Douglas Ross. Yeah, um, that is one of his three roles that he, that he carries out. Um, and yeah, um, from a leadership point of view, um, perhaps he should be coming in a lot more stronger in terms of you know um, showing racism, um, the uh, the red flag, the red cards, basically. Um, so it, it would be um, interesting to see how um, he actually, you know takes that as a leader and, and moves that forward, um, particularly given his, you know, role uh, within the Scottish government and um, as an MP in the, the, the UK government as well. There's been so many um, bits of uh, media and interviews getting carried out um, where, you know, it's not getting stamped out. Um, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't be hearing about, hate, you know, the hate crime and racism as well. Maggie, it's, you know, deplorable. It shouldn't be part of our, you know, our society. And yet we're hearing about it time and time again. Um, and, you know, we should we should be there supporting them and showing more leadership in terms of, you know, stamping this out completely. 
Azim Rafiq's testimony to the Parliamentary Select Committee where he unveiled the kind of racism he and others had experienced um, in Yorkshire had a, a few heads rolled. The chair of the Yorkshire Cricket, um, County Cricket Club resigned, the head of, the, of coaching was suspended and former England captain Michael Vaughan has been dropped temporarily, possibly, but maybe completely by the BBC for claims made against him. Sometimes when you, in, a, in a case like this, you think, that people do things like that, that heads roll, individuals fall on their sword, and then it all goes away. But actually, um, subsequent to that, we've been hearing and uh, that in within the world of cricket, white British cricketers from private schools are 34 times more likely than young Asians or black or blacks to um, reach the elite levels of cricket. Now, I could argue that in Britain, it's not just cricket that happens in. Um, uh, Kurt, it's it's establishment anyway. You're more likely to be a banker, 34 times plus probably more likely to be a banker or in the stock exchange or even in parliament if you're white and from a private school than from a, a state school or a person of colour. Um, so do you think um, there is institutionalised racism throughout UK society uh, that we all know about, but we just kind of brush it under the carpet if it doesn't affect us? I think so. And I don't think it's just UK society or American society. And I think I, obviously both both our countries have become become uh, immigrant societies. Ours ours has been since since the beginning. Some some immigrants not willingly as as with the with the black cloud of slavery over us all the time. Um, I think I think that this these are windows, as you as you set up uh, into a phenomenon that uh, that had a baseline that was there, but then got amplified and licensed in a way through Brexit. Uh, it made it safer to be uh, divisively racist. It, it, it seemed to it seemed to, to give people uh, uh, the ability to uh, to feel like this is sanctioned. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case in this particular cricket episode. Um, whether that was that was a deciding factor or it was just something that was endemic for a long time in that in that sport but um but i do think that there was definitely an uptick uh five and a half years ago uh and uh and and that demonstrates that uh these things that are these these problems that are latent in our society or endemic in our society can be amplified from the top by uh, by signals from 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 political elites mm. that uh, that this is okay, and I think that's woven through on the the migration issue, as you were talking about with the with the way the home op, the home secretary is dealing with this, and so on. That 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 the, 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 they create the signal and then they say they're responding to the signal. Colette, given that sport is so important to the development of young people in the development of and personal development in terms of fitness. And we can pretty much all agree that being involved in sport is a good thing. And given that so many young people have such role models in sport and heroes and heroines that they look up to, it's absolutely essential, is it not, that all sporting bodies really get to grips with this and put a stop to it. And what would you like to see the Scottish government doing around that within context of Scottish sporting establishments to make sure that racism um, on any any sort of prejudice at all, whether it be prejudice against people with a disability or sexism or whatever, is stamped out at the very beginning? Yeah, I think um, we need to do more um, in terms of, you know, some kind of initiative or, or, or campaign to completely stamp it out. I mean, um, I know that there, 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 there's some work actually being, being done, but Maggie, I think we still need to do more in light of the fact, you know, I think this comes from more of a generational thing as well, the institutional racism, and even from a, a local um, authority perspective within even our education establishments, um, that everybody's equal. Um, I know some of the work being undertaken even um, here locally within um, uh, South Lanarkshire College, 
they're they're done a huge amount of work on you know diversity and equality as well and i i do think we've done a remarkable amount of work but i mean having worked within a uh, outdoor educa education previously i see how important you know um edu you know sporting and education um, is and um, particularly given it's linked to our poverty as well but I, I still think we, you know, there's still a long way in actually, you know, um, tackling the inequality there, particularly in, in, in racism. But I actually met with a group of young people um, from one of the local schools, and they they honestly didn't think there there was much weight, much in the way of um, issues over racism. Um, here in Scotland, it was more sectarianism, and that we had to stamp it out. But that's more of a West of Scotland thing. Um, if if we could do something on that level as well, um, then you know I, I I think we would go a long way, um, and and I think young people can it could teach us a thing or two about that as well. Yeah, well, the racism route spilled over onto Question Time on Thursday night on the BBC in answer to a question from an audience member about the Yorkshire Cricket Club. Um, instances, Fiona Bruce turned to the only non-white person on the panel to basically ask him what his ex personal experience of racist abuse was and he quipped back, ah, the brown person will answer first. Fiona Bruce realised she'd made a bit of a faux pas and then turned to someone else on the panel. But who did she turn to? Well, none other than George Jordan Peterson, the extremely right-wing and controversial Canadian academic, and I'm using air quotes for a reason, um, who is well known for being someone who denies that institutional racism exists. In fact, twice on the programme, he talked about racism in air quotes, and it was down to the SNP representative on the panel to challenge him on that. I'm just wondering, Kurt, why do you think the BBC are so keen to give a platform to extreme right-wing views. I mean, news, news, um, Question Time is famous for it. Nick, Nigel Farage nearly had a regular seat on the programme. Nick Griffin's been on. Peterson's been on more than once. Um, and, um, and I said earlier that the op Belarusian opposition were concerned that the BBC gave this long interview to Lukashenko, which they just saw as a platform for propaganda. So why do you think the BBC do it? I think, I think this is... a. Uh this is quite often a media thing where they, they, they there's there's a focus on spectacle and and both sides ism gets gets more viewers that or at least that's the that's the perception uh so so it doesn't matter how representative of you might be it's it's how sensational uh the interchange might be or even even the lead up uh to get people to to tune in uh, i suspect that's a large part of it is is uh and this is not necessarily a new phenomenon, but it's uh, as media has become more competitive uh, and uh, more more commercialized, that has become uh, a driver. Uh, that, that and so you you it, it helps it helps it's a, it's an accelerant to the division in the society, and you see this in social media too, which isn't you know, BBC, but um, that's that's my 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 first stab at it. Um, it's quite a common, um, it's quite a common thing to do, isn't it, Colette? When you're dealing with anyone who's been the subject of any kind of prejudice, whether it's as I say, disabled person, uh, woman, whatever, to turn to the victims to ask them to say, "How has it been for you?" But actually, by doing that, what you're sort of doing is letting everyone else off the hook. Surely, we have to, we all have to own whatever prejudice is out there in society. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, there's probably too much air time given to the victim and not to the actual um, people that are, uh, you know, are, are at the heart of, of this as well and, and on what they're doing to actually tackle it. So the air time that they're actually given to these people that you, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, it, the imbalance there in terms of reporting, um, we've seen it time and time again. We should be holding, you know, more of the people who are responsible for pushing, you know, the agenda forward and, and asking them to tackle some of the challenges that they're facing as well. So um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I, I think, you know, our, our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has done remarkable work and that's been showcased 
um, over you know COP26 and whatnot as well, and how we can actually um, start leading on aspects and areas and topics like this as well. And I, I you know, well, it was heartening to see Stephen Flynn on the BBC Question Time um, on Thursday night. Um, that we've actually got a, a, you know, a member of the third biggest party here in the UK um, getting some airtime for a change and quite rightly challenging um, the things that he said and you know, his, his quotes as well. So um, we need to you know, have more people, you know, leaders on there um, coming up with solutions um, and having a more balanced approach um, rather than hearing from these right wing, um, you know, I, I, you know, again. Um, well, you're right. Steve, watch what I'm <laughs> Stephen, Stephen did. Stephen absolutely jumped on him um, over the racism thing. I mean, he called him out right there and then for using the air quotes. But he also challenged him on the other thing that Peterson said on the night that was pretty contentious, and that was a discussion about the corruption of MPs and the two job issue where he actually tried to make a case that it was really tough for people who became MPs because they had to give up really good careers and it was very difficult for them to do that and they should be looked on as kind of special and entitled and it was absolutely all right for them to keep two, three, four or five jobs or whatever. And Stephen Flynn absolutely nailed that with them and, and pointed out that that was unacceptable. And it does seem to be that public opinion on that issue is certainly moving away from the sense of entitlement to more than one job that so many MPs have. I saw a, a very funny cartoon this morning and it's Boris Johnson standing in front of his backbencher saying, you've only got one job and that's not to get caught. Um, if you're not familiar with Jordan Peterson, I mean, he doesn't just, he doesn't just deny institutionalised racism. He denies the patriarchy exists. There is no patriarchy, but instead there is a hierarchy predicated on competence. So there you go. And he says that man, uh, he's the man who's claimed that order is masculine and chaos is feminine. Well, I wouldn't mind taking a bit of my feminine chaos to him. Um, thank you both very much for joining me today. It's been a full programme. We've got a really lot of in-depth, big stories. Maybe if you don't know much about Bosnia, what's happening in Bosnia, Go and do some research. It really is a fascinating um, situation and let's hope that it doesn't turn out quite as badly as Kurt is suggesting. But I suspect Kurt's the expert. He knows what he's talking about. Um, I'll be back again on Thursday night for the seven o'clock show. In the meantime, have a lovely Sunday afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you.